I'm Thomas from Meaningful Gigs, and welcome back to another episode of Heroes of the Creative Revolution. In this episode, we speak with Lisa Towns of Realtor.com as she talks about her experience running design ops as a former designer. In this episode, she talks about her transition from designer to design ops, running design ops on limited resources, how to balance progress and perfection, and much, much more. Well, let's dive in. Lisa, welcome. Uh, super excited to have you on. Would uh, love to hear about kind of your background. I see that you were a graphic designer before. So how did you get into the, the ops world? Yeah, so my background is a little bit of a winding road, which I feel like a lot of people in design ops tend to take some other course rather than the straight and narrow. Um, yeah, I started out in graphic design and advertising, worked at ad agencies for a few years. And then in 2008, when the housing market crashed, um, my copywriter and I decided to go off on our own and start our own design studio. Um, it was a design letterpress studio. So we ended up kind of shifting into some wholesale business and actually selling gifting goods to a lot of larger companies like Target, um, Urban Outfitters, Papyrus, you name it. If it was a greeting card or gift wrap, like we had it, we were selling selling it to those stores. And so, um, you know, I think when you start a business from the ground up and if you've worked at a small business or a startup, you're doing all the things. You are essentially doing operations. You're hiring people, you're doing finance, you're training, you're figuring out processes, creating documentation, and you're calling running it a business. But essentially when you get into the corporate world, you're like, oh, this is operations. <laughs> and so um, about a few years ago, we decided to sell our business. It was on great terms. Um, my business partner and I were just going in different directions. And I decided to go back to the corporate world and I got into product design. So I was at Expedia for a couple years. And then I'd say about two and a half, three years ago, moved over to realtor.com and I was on the design team there. When I first started, there was maybe 15 designers on the team. And then within a year, we grew to about 50. And so you can only imagine the types of inefficiencies that were starting to happen, unintentional disorganization, um, you know, ownership over who owned what and, you know, all of those things that just started kind of snowballing. And of course, I couldn't take my operations hat off. So I started doing that side of desk, started helping out organizing things. Um, and it just became inherent that this was where I wanted to go. And I um, advocated for the design ops role at realtor.com. And I have been um, in that position for about two years now. Um, and so I love what I do. It's great working with my team. I really try to dig in to find out what their problems are. And I essentially feel like I'm still designing, but it's just for designers. Super interesting. So you, you're an entrepreneur. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I connect with that and it, you're right. Like I, I've built two companies and you're always doing everything. And even right. as you're growing, you still need to do so much. So I don't feel like not everybody has the design background and how does it feel to be kind of not the designer, not controlling the design process, but controlling the operations. Yeah, a lot of people ask this. I think I'm a little bit of a different designer and I always have been. Um, I'm very type A personality. I don't like to procrastinate. If there is a deadline on my plate, I will make sure it is done well in advance so I'm not stressing out. <laughs> and so I think those two sides of my brain tend to work really well together where I am organizing things. I mean, I'm very organized in my regular life anyway, but um, the designer part of me, I was okay with letting that 
go because I still feel like I'm helping out the design team. Um, and I have such a strong understanding of what designers need being on that side that I can speak up for them and contribute in such a different way that maybe the design team feels like they necessarily can't. So I'm not afraid to jump in and say, hey, we need to be in this meeting or we need to have this conversation or you know if i'm seeing that maybe we can scale something for the design team that everybody's benefiting from it i'm just really good at connecting those dots and making sure that you know the the designers are are getting what they need but i'm still getting fulfilled at the same time yeah no that that's great i feel like i, I wish more people were like you you understand your own superpower and then you're like okay i'm gonna use my superpower to help the team instead of holding on to one kind of identity yeah, yeah. Kind of, that's amazing um also side note you, you mentioned papyrus have you ever seen the snl uh clip with brian gosling and papyrus <laughs> <laughs> if, if, yeah for anybody that hasn't seen it just it's one of the funniest snl skits it's just i mean for any it. any font nerd out there you'll yeah. just laugh because it's so good <laughs> it's it's perfect it's perfect Okay, so now you've you've ventured in, the team has grown from 15 to 50, you're kind of like optimizing. So yeah, what what exactly are you doing at this point? Like how are you optimizing these workflows? How are you making things better? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned before, um starting out as the only design ops person and being a team of one, there's so many directions you can go in and so many different pain points that the team needs to have addressed. And so, um, you know, especially now with this type of economy that we're in, we really need to work lean and we need to be smart about how we're doing things. And I feel like this is a common thread that seems to be happening a lot right now of, you know, maybe headcount had been there. I had it at one point and it was taken away and, you know, assets are frozen and, you know, certain funding isn't there anymore. And I think this is where my entrepreneurial part of my brain really kicks in of, I need to get it done in some way. So it's sink or swim. And I started noticing that um, when I transitioned into this role, designers were still doing certain operations, but it was more side of desk. And it was more in the frame of for their squad or for themselves. So I would see a designer saying, oh, I organized my Figma files in this way during a presentation. Or, you know, there'd be like some team that was doing um, some kind of documentation in a really great way. And we would share some of the stuff during our design share outs. And so I started thinking about it and I connected with a few of the designers and I would just say, hey, are you really interested in scaling this for the team? You know, you're obviously doing it on your own. You seem to have some kind of passion for what you're doing. Would you want to work with me on this? And so it then became this relationship of me being able to look at it from this 30,000 foot view of how do I make these processes and implementations and scale them for the team? But then I'm also able to work with these designers that are looking at it from the 10,000 foot view of what their needs are. And so they can address that. And it's almost like we're combining our skills. So we'll have working sessions sometimes um, and we'll have like check-ins and that way I'm not necessarily having to be in the nitty gritty IC work of operations and I'm able to manage it on a larger scale. But then also those designers are, you know, maybe if they're mid-level or maybe junior, they're, they're starting to gain those skills of working more for the org or being able to present things to the team and like really grow in their development. So it's almost this really nice symbiotic relationship. Okay. okay, so it sounds like you, yeah, you work directly with the team and then combine kind of your superpowers with theirs and because you're looking at the world a little bit differently and so you're able to get their buy-in first and then show them how we could all work together to make things better for the entire sure. company. Yeah, yeah, definitely.
Uh, yeah, it's top of mind for everybody right now. It's it is the the budget cuts and, and headcount cuts. Like, what are you like? What are you doing with kind of those limited resources? Like, how has your mind shift or your your mindset shifted? Right. I, I mean, I think it's what I said before. I think you know when you own your own business, times are great or times are lean, and then you need to just be able to pivot in order to make things work. And I think you have to have that frame of mind that it might not be what you expected it would be before when it was this, you know, if you had all the money in the world to do an offsite and you wanted all the designers there, but now there's no travel um, or there's no budget for getting everyone in the same city, then how can we do that in the same way that you can still get a similar outcome but not necessarily have all those resources. And so I think, you know, I always say that um, progress over perfection is really the way to handle operations. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. Things are always going to change. You can't really handle what the macroeconomics are or what your company is going to be doing. But what you can control is your mindset and how you're going to actually be able to work with what you have. Hmm. Yeah, so so just shift instead of kind of having that fixed mindset of saying like, hey, this is like, I need X to do Y, you need to be have a growth mindset and say, okay, well, now things have shifted. What can I do differently? Right, right. Are there any like you, you mentioned kind of an offside? Are there any uh, maybe a, a story or something that you did differently that um, you could share? Hmm. Trying to think about that. Um, this is where you'll probably edit me out thinking. <laughs> or not, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I keep coming back to or an example that um, I can think of is I don't know if I use the word, but when I describe the people that I'm working with that I want to potentially help me and like they have their superpowers, I like to call them my design op advocates, even though I know that, you know, they're still designers, they're managers, they're ICs, they're doing what they're doing. But I do love this idea again of like, calling them advocates and saying like, we're working together, we're in this relationship together. And I do I'll tend to lean into them a lot just because I don't have that head count and I am that small team of one. And I find that just being real and being personable with people and letting them know like, hey, here's where we are with our budget or here's where we are with you know being able to go to an offsite and we can't what what kind of brainstorming can we do i really love working with people and collaborating with people i think it's important to to have conversations with leadership and make sure that they understand where you're going and so it's it's really important to, I think, foster those relationships. So I don't know if I can think of like any specific event, but I think it's just that idea that I have learned to embrace that, you know, doing it alone is never really going to, um, I'm never gonna have the answer. I'm never going to be able to come up with something 100% that everyone's going to love on my own. And I think collaboration is just so key. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's great. So, you know, some people are looking at the kind of the glass half full and you're, I mean, the, the glass half empty and you're looking at the glass half full, right? So they're saying, hey, we don't have a budget. And you're saying like, no, now we, we're this team. Like, what can we do together to make more things happen? Like, how can we dig into with each right. other and connect? And yeah, so, so that makes total sense. And that sounds like it's like a daily kind of weekly thing. It's not just this one time. Thing. Totally. And that's just how I love to operate. I always joke around teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> you know, I mean, awesome. if, if you're not uh, working together, I feel like you end up working against one another. And that's not like a great way to be working anyway. It's not going to make life easy. You're probably going to resent people. So it's it's just better to, you know, really try to collaborate and work as a team.
like with all work environments and all projects and all you know good times and bad times there are challenges that come up and if you were to kind of look back and think about one of the biggest challenges you had to face well what would that be I mean, you know, I think I mentioned before, um, progress over perfection, I think is is so key, no matter what operations role you're in. Um, as I mentioned, things are going to change. Things are not going to be perfect. Maybe, you know, a great example is I might put something together for the team that they've been asking for. And, you know, it's maybe a, a session with um, a certain speaker and then only a certain amount of people come. And I'm like, well, I thought I was doing what you all wanted me to do. And I put this together and, you know, this is creating community and, this sounds like something that I put the survey out and everybody wanted to do it. And then only half the team showed up. But then I have to remember it's progress over perfection. Like the people that wanted to be there were there. And I'm going to, you know, be so glad that they got out of it what they needed to get out of it. Or maybe the people that couldn't come had other meetings or maybe they weren't in the mental space to be there or whatever. So I think sometimes it's also giving me a little bit of grace and being okay with, you know, what my outcomes are or setting my expectations to a certain level. And so I, I think that's really important. Um, I think uh, somebody told me, don't let perfection be the enemy of good is also just a really great way to frame your mindset and, and how you handle things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's real. So yeah, progress from perfection. I think there's, I was watching the Nike movie by Air and yeah. I think one of their principles was like perfect process, not perfect outcomes or something. Right, so right. The process that you follow, but the outcomes you can't always control. Totally. And that's just how things are going to be. I mean, I think I used to be so stuck in, I wanted to get from point A to point B, no matter what I did in my career or just, you know, in my personal life, I'm never the type of person who enjoys the journey. <laughs> and so I've had to really teach myself and learn that it's okay. That's part of it. And that, you know, you will eventually get to point B and point B might not look like what you thought it was going to be, but that's still okay. Yeah, I I teach that to everybody at, at my startup. That, oh, you do? Uh, yeah, because our heart wants point B, right? It's, it's our intuition, our feeling. We want to be somewhere, but those outcomes, if we hold on to them, they hurt us because we can't always control how we get there. And the thing that we can is what I say is like in our head. And that's the like, well, what can you do? Take one step in front of the other and right. if your, your head and your heart get together, then sometimes it's great. And then, but if it doesn't happen, you shouldn't be uh, kind of married to those outcomes. And a lot of times what people thought they wanted to be in in that point B ends up not being the right thing. And they went down to path C and they're like, God, I went down path C instead of B. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I think a lot of people don't even think to go to path C until they're already there. And then they look back and they're like, man, had I known, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, what what's, uh, what's the most fun you've had doing your job? I am a big documentation nerd, so I will say that I do love that. I love trying to get everyone to document, but I know it's not going to happen. I do volunteer to do it, though, for other teams. Um, but besides that, I think that, honestly, the team that I'm on right now and the reason why I ended up going to Realtor.com was the people that work there. Like, I just really loved my coworkers, and when I got to know them, I just realized that it was a design team full of people that didn't have egos, that were willing to step in and help out, that really had that mindset that I was talking about of like working together and collaborating. And I feel like you don't get that a whole lot um, in a lot of corporate jobs. Um, and so when I felt that sense of 
this could be like a really great place to work. I just knew that the fun was going to come. And so, you know, being able to hang out with them, having some of our like team all hands and team meetings, and sometimes we play games together. We're a distributed team, so it's always different on what we can and cannot do. Um, but even hanging out with the ones that are local in Austin, it's always a good time. If you look back on your career, we're talking about kind of point A and point B. If you were able to go back to early days, point A, um, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> oh, there's so many things. Um, I heard a really great quote listening to a podcast recently. I think Jane Fonda said it, that no is a sentence. And I was thinking, wow, that's crazy. I, I feel like when you're your younger self or even now, you tend to try to say yes to everything and you think you can handle it all and do it all. And sometimes no can be the right answer as well. Um, so I think it just, you know, depends on the situation, obviously, but I do think that was like just so strong and really struck me. I, I know like when we were preparing for this, I was thinking of something else. And then I literally heard that in a podcast yesterday when I was walking and I was like, wow, that really just struck a chord with me. No is a sentence. I love that. And, and it is very, very profound. I think it, it takes wisdom to get to that point where you can say no and it, it's it's about understanding yourself understanding right. like your limitations what's what you can and can't do and I think you're absolutely right if more young people could say no more they they would definitely find more fulfillment and happiness well what do you think is um, what's challenging for you to say no to even today <laughs> I feel like I always want to help everybody. And I feel like I have the time, which I don't. And so <laughs> I think, you know, it's that balance of being okay with it and taking the time to sit with yourself and say, can I actually do what I just said yes to? I think we're so quick and just so willing to like go, go, go that you, you aren't really willing to listen to what you can accomplish or even what you want to do that you find meaningful. Great, awesome. Well, it's a, it's a great place to end. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, thank you.